Tom here from Learn Systems, and welcome to a special sponsored interview and technical demo. Sponsor's video is Zoros. They offer web filtering software that makes it easy for you to protect and monitor your endpoints anywhere your users work via their endpoint agent. Of note, they're not only a sponsor, they're a product we've been using for quite a while now. If you're interested in signing up for a demo or to try out their product, there's a link right in the top of the description where you can get started. Now there are two parts to this video. This one is about the web filtering product they offer and down in the description is a, another interview we did about their engagement product, which helps with employee engagement. It's actually a really interesting discussion, not a, only about the tool, but about managing productivity and efficiency. So check out that video on my other channel linked right down below. One last note I want to add before we dive into our technical demo is this is targeted at IT providers or managed search providers like myself as a tool for us to use to manage filtering at our clients. It's not really designed for individual end users to sign up for filtering on their own computers. So let's get started with the demo. All right, I'm joined by Brett, and he's going to show us where the product lives, kind of how it works functionally. How are you doing, Brett? I'm doing fantastic. How are you, Tom? Great. So we want to block or use our uh, site here, totalwine.com, and talk about how your product can stop people from going to totalwine.com or any other website you don't want them to go to, really. <laughs> yeah, so with Zorus uh, being endpoint-based, uh, we have a very unique way of being able to intercept all communication coming off of the device without it actually leaving the device. So this picture here, I love pictures because I feel like pictures speak a thousand words. You know, this is a basic, no filtering kind of setup, um, you know, how the internet works, so to speak, in its most simplest form, you know, so you, you want to go to totalwine.com, reaches out to your DNS server, whatever it might be, and then it says, you know, that's the phone book, what IP address am I supposed to go to, returns that, and then it sends you off on your merry way. With Zorus, what's really cool is this is an allow example if this person was allowed to go to totalwine.com before it even leaves the machine we analyze where they're trying to go whether this is tcp traffic for dns whether this is udp traffic for dns it doesn't matter whether it's the browser or an application that's trying to reach out again doesn't matter um, we intercept all those dns requests and analyze them before against our zor security policy this goes through a scrutiny of you know, threat detection, intel, as well as content filtering in, in the sense of just, hey, they're not allowed to go to alcoholic websites. In this case, they can, so it allows it. And once it's allowed, it lets it off on its merry way, uh, not messing with any routes. If we were going to block that, though, it would say, hey, they're not allowed to go here. This is deemed, you know, uh, something, a place that they can't go. So we're going to give them a block page and just completely ignore the rest of the network. And it just never, ever leaves the machine to begin with. And I like that you use a laptop for the example, because that's a very important point. People don't always work in the office and I don't always have control over where they may be working or their firewall. So having it on that laptop, hey, cool, it's inside your corporate network. It's working. It's outside your corporate network here at Starbucks and you still can't go to TotalWine.com. So it's uh, it's at the endpoint level and not monkeying with anything. And also, uh, you know, for extra clarification, if you do have local DNS, like your Microsoft is running Active Directory, those DNS servers, it doesn't monkey with that either. Those requests aren't going to get filtered. Correct. And, and I think that's the beauty of it. A lot of people will travel around in hotels or airplanes and different scenarios where DNS really can't be tampered with, but we still need to filter them and keep the device safe. Um, in those cases, we we work very well to prevent any kind of weirdness in activity. It's just as simple as, yes, they're allowed to go here. No, they're not allowed to go here. Leave the rest of the network alone um, so that regular operations can exist. And also you're not changing what their DNS servers are. I will still specify in that laptop, whatever those DNS servers need to be, you know, example being Windows domain controllers, and you're not messing with that part of it. You're taking those other DNS requests because you're analyzing them on the endpoint level and only taking external requests and doing the analysis to them. It doesn't, it's not like you're just specifying your outside DNS servers. That is where sometimes people can say, oh, can I use this like some external DNS server that does filtering? I've talked about like quad nine, but it's really not the same level at all. That just does some of the most basics and also will break everything if you tried to do that in a corporate environment. This is why we use 
Zoras for this particular purpose. Yeah, exactly. And when you're when you're replacing that DNS server, internal resources and, and different routes um, will start kind of breaking down. You have to set up configurations of secondary DNSs and different things like that to get that replacement to work or DNS loopback issues, whatever it might be. Uh, you run into kind of a myriad of issues um, when you're changing that DNS. And as we all know, in, in the IT field, <laughs> DNS causes a lot of problems when you touch yes. it. So just leave it alone. <laughs> and that's yes. kind of our philosophy. <laughs> and, and, it's, and like I said, you're not changing the servers on this. They can still get through DHCP. They can still grab whatever they want. And your endpoint tool is working in concert with whatever your DNS is to add these extra features to it. So that's that's an important distinction I want to make sure because there's a reason, you know, we've tested all these things. I'm familiar with what bricks. I've I've gone through the gamut of these things. And maybe probably a lot of people are watching this going, yeah, I, I dealt with all those other things Tom just mentioned that broke. So <laughs> you don't break those things. That's a very, uh, something that sets Zoros apart, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, networks are complicated. You know, we'll, we'll leave that to the network guys to, mm -hmm. to go manage that and, We'll just make sure that whatever traffic comes off the device is uh, is appropriate. Okay, so where we kind of start in Zorus is really around the policy. When you're setting up a customer, each customer is kind of unique in the sense of like, what can they do? Um, where can they go? You know, schools have a very strict policy. You know, different businesses might have very open policies. Point of sale solutions have a very strict or kiosk, you know, you want to block basically everything, you know, we make it really easy to do that. So this is effectively what uh, the, you know, the policy configuration can look like. We categorize the entire internet using crowdsource uh, kind of methodologies and be able to break down different uh, websites, categories, and what you want to allow. So in my standard uh, ability here, I block adult content, drugs and alcohol, and then obviously security. So security is kind of tucked away here. This isn't really content filtering. This is the security filtering. This is the thing that should never be allowed, right? Yeah. Um, but we have a lot of, of items in here that go through. So all of that traffic, every single request, like I said, it's not just their browser, it's any application they try to download and execute on or whatever might try to run off of that machine, we scan through our threat intel, which is inclusive of obviously botnets, hacking sites, infected sites, key logging, malware. I think a really big one that I always like to call out is you know, kind of like newly registered domains. It's very common for yes. phishing uh, attempts to just build up a new domain, put up a website, and then try to fish you on that. Um, we will automatically block anything that is uh, has been created within the last 30 days, which I think is very cool. And that's one that can't be overlooked because the latest uh, malware campaigns, especially against content creators, that's one of the key things you can look up and see, oh, they registered this domain like less than a week ago and sent out a massive campaign. And you rarely run into a business problem doing this, though. The newly registered domain is not something that causes much drama because most business sites didn't register yesterday and start today. And you can <laughs> examine them on a case by case basis if one of those problems comes up. And that's and that's what makes it really easy. I'll go through the whole unblock request kind of oh, concept yeah. here in a minute, which has made that whole, hey, I got blocked and it makes that a lot easier. Yeah. Um, to finish up on the policy here, though, uh, as far as just, you know, being able to safe list items, block list items, say there's particular items within a category that you want to allow, or maybe there's uh, things that are allowed, but you want to block a specific thing uh, under an allowed category, you have the flexibility of doing that. Um, as well as IP-based um, blocking for GeoIP. So um, we'll look up the IP address. We'll see what the origin country of that IP is from, and you can block based on that country. Um, so this comes into handy if you want to, you know, let's say block all traffic from, you know, in, in, let's say Al Algeria or whatever it might be. But you could also just say, hey, I only want to allow traffic from the United States, and that's it and it'll just block everything else, which becomes very handy again for, um, you know, like devices that are really needing to be locked down and what they're allowed to speak to. And then 
last uh, but not least, you know, enforcing safe search. So schools, this is very common, you know, yes. that way if they're searching uh, Google or whatever it might be, we turn that safe search on automatically as well as, you know, a safe list only. So whatever is in your safe list is the only websites this particular device can go to or group of devices. And then block traffic on, on agent failure. This is, this feature is strictly for like the super, super strict. If it hasn't been filtered, block it. So if our infrastructure were to whatever blip or go down for whatever reason, block everything because, you know, it's not safe environment um, is kind of the concept there. And that's, that's the policy configuration there. It's, it's pretty straightforward and simple. Again, you'd set this up, you know, kind of customer by customer. Um, and you can apply that there and I, I can go through that in a moment, okay. but let's, let's look at like kind of what a block looks like real quick. Sure. So I'm going to open a new tab. I'm going to go to our total wine example because, you know, sometimes you just need some wine. This is effectively, so I am obviously running Zorus. You'll see this little tray icon here in, in the bottom right, uh, which is our agent that is brandable and you know the logo the text everything that you want it to say you can make it you know your uh, designation but I think what's really cool is if a user a very common issue is hey I'm supposed to get the total wine I, I like it's Friday afternoon and I'm trying to order some wine for the team and um, you know how do I get through to this well traditionally speaking you would have to open up a support tic ticket with your 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 service tech they would you'd have to wait on that. And then, you know, they'll get back to you. They'll ask you why you're trying to get there. All, you know, this whole myriad of, of issues uh, going with that. Now, you can simply just say, hey, like, let me in here. Hey, it's Friday. Let's have some wine. <laughs> I realize that's real small. But, but this yeah. is what your, your end user would be able to do. And then they submit that. And now your technicians have just been notified that a particular device and a particular customer is requesting to go to TotalWine.com. So let's see what that looks like back in the portal here. Yeah. And by the way, it does support, you can tie this to email and ticketing on your back end. So as from an MSP tooling standpoint, it can be integrated into your workflow on your side. Yep. So from there, this is what that just came in as. Um, you'll see it's my device, who's logged in, um, you know, the policy that they're on, where they were trying to go, why it was blocked. So whether it was blocked for geo IP reasons, malicious reasons, or just content reasons, category that it was, their request, hey, it's Friday, <laughs> you know, let's have some wine. Now from here, I can allow or deny it as the technician. This is all based on permissions, right? Not just anybody can come in here and start making modifications, but I, as an authorized user, am allowed to do it for this particular device. So I can sit here and say, okay, let's uh, let's allow this traffic and let them have their fun. So in a moment here, you'll see this this pop up here that just came up. This notified the user, hey, your technician just approved this. You can now go to this website, and it was that you saw how fast that was. Oh yeah, and it's nice because you don't they're not following up on a ticket, going back and forth, and getting aggravated. The request comes through in the back, and we can look at it and decide internally was this an in was this valid? Was it something they should do? Um, and we can just say yeah, that probably should have been blocked, or yes, this is a valid reason, and go ahead and approve. And without them seeing anything other than they hit the request, we hit the approve, they get the little pop up. Oh cool, I can go to totalwine.com now. That yeah. workflow is actually really smooth. Very smooth. And, and it, it creates such a, a delight for your end user to be able to just go, oh, wow, like that, that was really nice. Now, if they get a deny, you know, that maybe you just ruin their fun for the day. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, policies are policies. And, you know, sometimes you do have to deny the request as well. Yeah, those it, it my my overall experience though has been it's relatively smooth. You do have to have some internal decision making going on, not because of Zorus, but because people will ask for things that you're you'll scratch your head. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll put reasons yeah, in it. I want to laugh too. <laughs> yeah, and 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 it's all audited, right? So you can see I do um, all sorts of um, requests going through as demos. Um, so that uh, who approved it, why, et cetera, all goes through, um, yes. auditing there is, yeah, there is accountability. You can see the history of who did it, um, what the reasons were, and it's actually a good conversation. And you can take that to your client later and say, Hey, these are the requests that 
came through if if ever was a discussion or of to why like maybe you justified it maybe they had a question later some management but there's a whole workflow and audit trail that goes with it which is really nice yeah when, when it comes to just security products in general having that audit trail is very very key uh, to make sure yeah. that it changes to policies have happened you can track that so to touch on the the kind of being able to brand that block page this is you, you can brand not only just the icon of the tray if you decide to show that the tray is there uh, to know that you know this indicates to the user hey your device is being filtered it's safe and so on the actual logo you can change the text here you can see a preview of what you know your block page will look like and so on as far as being able to brand it you know, pretty straightforward here yeah. and then from there it's it's really just customer management so let's kind of jump in we'll go into my particular customer and be able to see kind of the different settings that we have so i think the big concept here is is groups within a customer think of this as though each group would have its own policy there's a lot of times where the ceo wants to be treated a little different than let's say the rest of the company so they get a special profile where they can go to facebook but nobody else can go to facebook that's a very common scenario that we see we allow you to be able to create groups within a customer of different machines and based on which group you're in is which filtering policy you get that's a really important aspect because a lot of times social media blocking is a pretty common request because there's not much of a business use for it. But if you have a marketing team that needs to update the Twitters and the Facebooks, they're going to need to have a policy on there and being able to start with a global policy and then granularly work your way down to group policies inside there that are all controlled really handy for being able to manage all of that. Yeah. And, and there's different settings that we can do as well within those groups to allow different behaviors of our agent. One of them is a policy schedule. Policy scheduling is as simple as, hey, during certain hours of the day, I want a different policy applied. So a, another example with social media, let's say we don't really mind around lunchtime and after hours, they should be able to go to Facebook or go to Instagram or whatever on their work device. You can actually set it up so that during 11 to 1 um, in their time zone, it will switch their policy to be a less strict to allow them to do those things. And then back once it hits 1 o'clock, it starts to block again um, is the concept there. Uh, you can also do different things like passive mode. Passive mode is show me what you would block, but don't actually block it. This allows you as you know, kind of a... Uh, an IT professional to see you know, what's if I were to set up this particular policy with this particular you know group of machines, what would get blocked from a content perspective? What would get blocked from a malicious perspective? Obviously, you want to block those things on the malicious side, uh, but it will it'll come back in what we call traffic logs and show you that, so you can kind of make your judgment on uh, what you do and do not want to do hiding the tray icon, hiding the unblock request in case you don't want people to be able to do that are uh, different ease of things. And then there's a, an engagement product that we'll get into at the end of this uh, that you can also add on here uh, from this particular standpoint. So now once we have those groups, um, it's very easy to deploy endpoints. Uh, the, the concept that we have here is we use your source of truth to deploy out. Um, many MSPs or internal IT shops, you already have a tool that you're probably doing software uh, deployment to. So we make it super easy to just say, hey, you know what? I want to import from that source of truth. So I'm going to run through kind of um, an example here. Since I'm a ConnectWise Automate uh, X veteran, uh, I'll use that as our example. But it's as simple as you connect to that data source you can now see the customers within that data source and how many endpoints are at each one of those customers. I can then simply start checking off, well, select policy first, Brett. We obviously need to select our base policy. This is typically you have somewhere where you start. Uh, this policy is made in the essence of all my customers have this kind of framework and then we deviate based on their needs from there. So I'll select that policy. 
Then I can select which uh, customers I want to import and move along. And this will just import those customers. We then configure your tool to be able to deploy our product through a script. And off it goes. You know, you, you, you go use in this particular case, you'd go to ConnectWise Automate, you'd run the install Zorus script, and it will automatically go to the particular customer within Zorus, and everything is set up and configured for you based on best practices. It, it can't get much easier than that. Yeah, and we're using it with uh, Ninja One. No problem. We can deploy it all of our customers. It, it supports a lot of different tools out there in terms of your MSP tooling on the back end. So I, your deployment, you understand how to do the integrations. They, they're relatively easy to get deployed and match up with your customers. So now that they're deployed, they're going to be filtering. Um, and to be able to see that traffic, it's as simple as coming over here to traffic logs. This is, again, this is my machine. We can see everything that's being kind of navigated to off of this machine. Again, it's not just browser traffic, it's anything. If, you know, uh, Office, you know, Word or anything is reaching out to stuff, we'll be able to see it and potentially block it. We can then quickly see the different blocks that I had while we're, you know, demoing just now. We can see the total wine requests and previous times that I've been, you know, kind of walking through the demo uh, for other people to block the same total wine, poor total wine uh, being blocked all the time. But, you know, sometimes it has to happen. And yeah, I mean, from from that standpoint, that's that's filtering kind of in a nutshell. It's a very straightforward use case, making sure, you know, we're keeping those endpoints safe, no matter where they are, airport, hotels, at the office, uh, regardless of what firewall you're behind. Yeah, no, it's it's a solid tool. It's one of the reasons, you know, we like it. It just makes it a lot easier for us to manage the diversity of clients we have and where they are at at any given moment. And as the, you know, some people work from home, three days a week, split offices are pretty common now where you come in two days and are out two days and that device moving back and forth, it just makes doing it at the firewall level impractical here. That's such an old way to do it as well. Um, firewalls as encryption becomes better, they come blinder and blinder things. That's why you got to jump it all the way to the endpoint to understand it. That's uh, that's just been where the market's moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just understanding who's going where as well. You know, a lot of times at the firewall level, you'll, you'll get some indicators of what device, oh, I got to look that device up. Who was logged into that device? You know, there's a lot of, uh, insight there that you got to start correlating together that we just put together for you yep. um, as far as being able to track by user. Let's talk a little bit about um, the other product within the Zorus portal, which is engagement. Uh, due to the fact that we're on the endpoint, we can see kind of the traffic coming off of that endpoint uh, as far as what websites people are going to, et cetera. We can now do what's uh, referred to as engagement uh, insights and being able to help you understand where time is being spent, not only in your own business, but as a service that you can provide to your customers. So right now, what that kind of looks like, and we'll look at me, this is my particular device last week. So we default to last week, week over week, I can kind of see last week I had the flu really bad. And uh, <laughs> I was pretty much knocked out on the on, on the couch or the bed all Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So you can see it literally did nothing on Monday and Tuesday. But once I got back and I didn't have a voice, but Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you can see I had about five and a half hours of activity and kind of like what I am generally doing throughout the week. I can now see this and have insights on this, um, you know, Slack time, Zoom. I'm on Gmail because we use G Suite here at Zorus. You know, me doing demos for the portal and, and so on. You can see not only their web traffic, but also what the thick client applications uh, and so on, as well as how much time I'm spending on Zoom. So you can see I spent four hours, 55 minutes on Zoom, and I'm listening to Spotify for two hours. This, this is pretty granular in the essence of individual. But kind of our vision here is being able to help not only at the individual level, but at the global level, understand where time is being spent in your entire company. Um, how many, you know, what SaaS apps are you using? How many people are actively using them? How long are they using them for? Um, you might be able to optimize on that standpoint. 
educational opportunities here. Seeing that individuals are spending an excessive amount of time in, let's say, Excel and is, you know, hey, let's let's do some education around Excel within our business. So that way we can optimize the time there and make sure that we're not spending too much time there um, and so on. There's there's a, quite a few use cases that you can use with this data insights um, yeah. at a macro level. Yeah. And this is something, and we have the other video linked down below that we do, we also dove into talking about it from a broader perspective of it's not about you know, watching and making sure people are being efficient, but if, let's say you have a sales team and one team member is spending way more time looking at a quote or spending more time in Excel. It kind of gives you baselines of your company so you can understand or as an MSP, talk to your clients and say, you know, this department, you know, is this your top performer? They spend the most time writing quotes or is this the person supposed to be writing quotes or do they just spend too much time because they don't understand a product and there's a training opportunity. So it just opens up the conversation so you can start engaging to understand why their profile may look different than others. And you can then you know, present that to the client because it, it gets you to have better conversations. You're like, wait, why does this person spend so much time in Excel when all the people, all the other people on our team don't? So those are, it just opens up those conversations. It's, I, I don't want people to perceive it as like, this is a spy tool or something <laughs> like that. It's really not. It's about trying to come up with better efficiencies of how things work. Yeah, I, if people do go very negative, very fast with this, um, <laughs> and it's so easy to do that, here's here's the fact you can't fix bad management and bad management will use this for bad things right that that's just the way it is um what i see though is huge upside and opportunity when it comes to your ability to operationally mature your team and your business by looking at data at a at a holistic level you don't need to look at it you know kind of specific to this one in in point here, but being able to look at it holistically, you can now get to understand the flows of your business and you can focus on your on your star players as well, because it hurts your business more losing your best talent than it does losing your worst. So I, th I think that's kind of overlooked in a lot of ways that, you know, what are you doing to engage with your overachievers and do you know who they are? especially like weekend warriors when they shouldn't be working on the weekends, being able to come in Monday morning. This is how I use this for my team. I come in Monday morning, I spend 10 minutes and I just peer at this and I'll be able to go person by person real quick and say, Oh, wow. I see, you know, Kate spent a lot of time Saturday and Sunday working in Jira that that's awesome. But at the same time, so I want to reward her. I want to say, Hey, you know, thank you for doing that. But why do you feel you need to do that? Now we can have a deeper conversation right. of like, you know, do I need to take something off your plate? Are you doing too much? Like, you know, what's going on so I can help you? And that feeling that you just gave your particular colleague is invaluable to being able to retain and keep them mentally healthy as well while working with you. So uh, those things go over like the... Uh, those things are not visible today as a, a hybrid environment. Yeah. And this offers some visibility into that. And like you said, it, it comes down to, are you going to use this tool for good or bad? That comes down to the workplace. That comes down to the management. You know, you have the, a good team. They're going to use it to say, all right, how do we optimize the team? How do we do things more efficiently? And, you know, this does open up that opportunity to do so. Yep. And then we, we can we can also drill in a little deeper on, on the IT side, MSP side, you definitely want to know, hey, if I had a security event on this particular device at a particular time, what was the user doing at that time? We can actually help you with that as well. So um, if I go to this device's activity logs, I can now see kind of what was going on uh, at a particular time and say, hey, this was related to the user. So we can see you know, whether I was using Slack at a particular time or what application, as well as each individual log. So if I need to do any forensic um, analysis, we can see we're doing a, a demo right now. So it's just a lot of portal yeah. logs here. But you know, if we need to do any kind of forensic analysis on this particular device at a particular time, we can rule out that the user had any involvement by looking at this uh, data, the exact same data we're using to summarize 
kind of at that holistic level as well. And we can export this and, and so on to be able to make sure that your customers or your constituents have the data insights they need to um, you know make a judgment call. Yeah, and just to be clear, it's logging, like you said, I heard you use the word thick apps, but the locally running apps on there as well. So it's not just web. This is actually very tied into everything the user's doing. And that gives you a great timeline for you know how the products or how things are being used. It's very interesting. Yeah, so for instance, the Slack here, this is, I installed the thick client Slack application. So it's detecting I'm using that Slack versus if this were inside Chrome, let's say, and I was using the Chrome-based one, it would show me in Chrome using Slack instead. Yeah, that's that's the summary um, uh, for engagement there. Very cool. Uh, links to the other videos I mentioned are down below. And uh, thanks for joining, Brett. This was great. This is a, a deep insight. And there's a link down there to sign up for Zorus and learn more and uh, have Brett give you a personalized demo. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. I would love to all see right. all of you. Thanks. Thanks, Tom.